Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, I'm Joel. Welcome to Crossroads. Uh, I'm the teaching pastor here, and Pastor Marcus, our senior pastor, is actually in Atlanta, Georgia, today speaking at a church. Check out this church's name. He's speaking at a church called Three Taverns. Do you know where that... Pop quiz. You're a Bible scholar if you know where that comes from in the Bible. Anybody? Anybody? Bueller? No? In Acts, there's a verse where it says, Paul was heading to a town and the people were so excited to see him that they ran and met him at a place called Three Taverns. Ah, well, Bible trivia for you this morning. Now you'll feel smarter, right? A few years ago, you, you, some of y'all know that um, I lead outdoor expeditions around the world. We do hiking, climb Mount Kilimanjaro, hike to Machu Picchu, do things like that. Well, I had a guy contact me a few years ago, and he said, hey, I want to do a sailing trip with your organization. I've got a sailboat. Would you want to do a sailing trip? And I was like, yeah, I'll get a team together. Where are we going to sail to? And he said, you name the place. I'll meet you there with my boat. I said, sweet, let's do Colorado. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, but I said, you know, there's this island off the coast of Florida called Dry Tortugas Island that I've always wanted to go to. There's a, there's a, a fort, a Civil War era fort. It's this beautiful fort on, it's made of solid stone out there in the middle of, just, I think it's like probably 30 or 40 miles off the coast of Florida. I said, I'd love to sail out there because you can camp out there and there's a coral reef around it. You can scuba dive. And he's like, that's a great plan. So have your team meet me in Key West, Florida. So we all flew down to Key West. And uh, when we got there, I learned a whole lot in a hurry about sailing because we were going to be the crew. So uh, he dropped off the crew that he had brought up. He had come up from a place called the Grenadines in the Caribbean and met us up there. And he dropped, us, dropped off his crew, and we were the crew. So I had to learn in a hurry all these nautical terms. And, um, so he said, all right, we're going to sail out there. So he taught us how to sail, and we sailed out to the island. And we, uh, basically, he said, we're going to put our anchor down here, and we'll camp out on the island at night. Well... Uh, he put the anchor down. There was a certain place that we could park the boat uh, because y- there's so much coral there that they didn't want your anchor damaging the coral. So there's this one area we could park. And so he said, we dropped the anchor. And he said, all right, now I need you to swim down there and make sure the anchor is attached really well to a rock. I was like, great, I'll do it. So I jumped in the water, had my little you know, goggles on. I swim down. I looked at the anchor as best I could. I was like, I think we're good to go. He's like, all right, sounds good. So we got off. And that, that day we had a great time um, swimming around and, and snorkeling, and we barbecued that evening, uh, grilled on the island, and then came back, and we just decided instead of camping on the island, we were just going to camp on the boat because we had a nice bed there. Well, we camped, and the next morning, though, we woke up, and I looked around, and I'm like, where'd our island go? <laughs> it was way, it was like farther off in the distance, and I, uh, we realized that I hadn't done a very good job making sure our anchor was attached to something solid. And over the night, we woke up the next morning, and everything looked completely different. And I think that's a good analogy for where a lot of us are today. You know, in in, in Hebrews, the Apostle Paul talks about, he says, we have this hope in Jesus as an anchor for our souls. Even when things get get chaotic, if we're anchored to the right thing, our boat's not going to go anywhere. But one of the challenges in the world we're living in, things are so crazy, everything's changed. It's like every morning you wake up and you're like, Oh no, another crisis? Have you noticed there's a new crisis every day? And you go, what in the world? And all the things that we thought were familiar, every morning you wake up and it's like, what has happened? And you feel like there's nothing anchoring you anymore. The world you used to live in, the things you used to take for granted, the things you used to think, well, this is the way the world is going to be. Everything's being shaken. You wake up and they're telling you all sorts of things. You know, men can have babies and all these weird things. And you're going... What? And there are people that are actually really vehemently like saying these things. And you go, what am I missing? Like, what has happened to the world? And if we're not careful, we end up being like that boat every morning we wake up and we end up feeling like we're floating a little bit away from what's familiar. But we have something we can anchor ourselves to. And it's Christ and what he's done for us. And I know that every one of us this morning, you've got some area in your life where every morning you wake up and you feel like, I can't take this anymore. I can't do another crisis. 
Maybe it's in your relationship with your spouse. It's just like, I just can't do this anymore. And you feel like I need something to anchor to. I, I need something, somebody to tell me this is going to be okay because the signs in this marriage are it's not going to be okay. Some of you are looking at your financial statements and you're going, wow, I am not going to be able to retire when I thought of it because that IRA that was going like this for a while is now going... And you're just like, it's, you look at it every day and you go, oh my gosh, where did all that money go? And you're realizing, I'm not going to be able to retire when I thought I could. Some of you, your savings accounts, you're looking at the inflation and you're going, man, at 8.7% inflation, every month my money buys less and less and less. And then you're going to the store and the price of beef has gone up. And you go to the gas station and the price of gas has just shot up. And you're looking at it and you're going, this is insane. And you're wondering, you know, I need somebody to, to like, is there, is there anybody out there that can tell me everything's going to be okay eventually? All of us at some, like, have something in our life where we're looking for some hope. We're looking for something to anchor ourselves to and say, okay, I know that in the end this is going to turn out good. I know that in the end all these things really are going to work out together for good, even though it doesn't look like it right now. And we've all got an area of our life. Some of you, it's in your relationships, some in your finances, some for your business. Some of you are just looking at the state of the world and you're going, what in the world? And we all want to know, is it going to be okay? And I've talked to the most optimistic people, people who normally their life, throughout their life, they've been very optimistic and positive and even keeled, and they're feeling just depressed and down. I've talked to so many people who are saying, I feel so ashamed to admit it. I'm not a depressed person, but I'm just depressed right now. Because our, our, our hope, what we... Our ability to, uh, our, our level of hope is directly correlated to how good we think the future is going to be. And if you look around right now, things are looking kind of bleak. And they're not showing a whole lot of sign of getting better. In fact, the signs we're seeing are that things keep getting worse and worse. But I'm here to tell you this morning that there is hope. Amen. This is not the end. Right. Right. In fact, King Solomon says the path of the righteous, that's you because of Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ made you righteous, able to stand before God in, in, in perfection. All he sees in you is Jesus Christ, if you've accepted the gift of Christ. It says the path of the righteous is like the light of dawn, and it just keeps getting brighter and brighter and brighter and brighter. In the first week in this series, inflation series, we talked about the fact that uh, it, it's a dark time right now, but this is our greatest moment to shine, because as the dark gets darker, the light gets brighter. That's if we're focused on the right thing. And we talked about the fact that there are two very real worlds. There's the physical world. That's what you see around you. That's what you can touch, taste, feel. You know, the gas you put in the tank is the physical world. But then there's another world that's just as real, and it's the spiritual world. And in many ways, the spiritual world is even more real than the physical world. Because what happens in the spiritual world eventually affects the physical world. That's why the Apostle Paul, he said this, he says, we don't lose heart, though outwardly in the physical world, it looks like we're wasting away. Yesterday, I was trying to get a chainsaw started, could not get it to start. This morning, my shoulder, I can barely lift it. I'm wasting away. As soon as you hit to your 40s, you start to realize you're wasting away, right? Outwardly, I'm wasting away. But inwardly, it says we're being renewed day by day in the spirit world. For this light and momentary affliction, it says it's preparing for us an eternal weight of glory that's beyond all comparison. So he says, here's what we do based on this reality. We fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. And how do you fix your eyes on something that's unseen? Well, there's another kind of eyes. It's the spiritual eyes. And it's the discernment that comes from realizing the real thing that's happening is all behind the scenes. It's in the spirit world. And we've got to start by focusing on that spirit world and recognizing that if we've got our eyes fixed on the physical world, we're not going to find a lot of hope. And the world around us, they're trying to find hope for the physical world in all sorts of philosophies and ideologies and doctrines. And the further you get away from God, listen, understand this, we're made to worship something. So if you're not worshiping God, you're going to find something to worship and you're going to find something that seems to promise the way out. So what people latch on to is, is philosophies. They'll say, well, you know, there's a popular philosophy right now. It's called postmodernism, and it's everywhere, but you don't realize it's everywhere. A guy named Michel Foucault back in 
or, or mid 19th century, he came, or 1900s, he came up with this and he basically said, there's no big story. Nobody's writing this big story with the world, which we as Christians believe God is writing a big story with the world. He says, you're, it's just up to you to kind of survive and use whatever power you can to make your own reality. And you see this all around the world. People say, well, I'll just make my own reality. Well, that's your reality, man. Well, there is reality. And you can argue against reality all you want, but eventually reality catches up to you. And then you get mad at the reality of the world and you go, that's not right. You say, I'm sorry, that's just the reality of the world. And what happens is we end up fighting against it. And so what people come up with philosophies and they'll say, well, you know how we can fix the world? If we can just get rid of racism, the whole world will be fixed. And listen, racism is something that's horrible and wrong. It's existed since the beginning of time and it needs to be gotten rid of. But that's not the only thing wrong with the world. There's a lot more wrong with the world. And some people say, if we can just fix financial inequality. And, and Jesus said something really uncomfortable. One of the things Jesus said that we don't put on Hallmark cards. He said, you know, the, the, those who have, more will be given to them. And to those who don't have, what they have will be taken from them. And it's not like he's condoning it. He's just saying that's the way the world works. And if you've looked around, you've probably seen that as much as we try and e make equality and equity, the rich always get richer and the poor always get poorer. And you can rant about it all day long. And, see, and, and look, we should try to fix that, but there's more wrong with the world than that. Right. In fact, what's wrong with the world, the core of it comes down to right here. What's going on in our hearts in the unseen world. Which is where we've got to stay focused. Because if we're trying to fix the physical world without dealing with the spiritual world, we're going to find ourselves hopeless. Because physical solutions will never solve the issues in our world. One of the foundations of communism is a concept called dialectical materialism. Now, don't check out on me. You're like, I didn't sign up for a college course. I came to church. Hang on. I'm going to explain something here. <laughs> dialectical materialism is the idea put forth by Karl Marx and Engels, Frederick Engels before him, but that the only thing that really exists is what you can see and touch and taste and feel. That's the only reality, materialism. And if you want to change people's hearts and mindsets, all you have to do is change their environment and the situation they're in, and, they're, and, and then they'll change in their heart. But you know, the Christians, we believe the total opposite of that. Right. We believe you can change no matter what the environment is, which is our hope in the middle of this. Right. And I've heard politicians say, man, if all, you, I actually heard a politician say this, you can't change hearts, you can only change rules and regulations, and then people have to follow them. I'm like, actually, you can change hearts. That's why I'm in the business I'm in and not in politics. Amen. And what's crazy is when you change hearts you begin to see the outward transformation you're looking for. It all starts with the heart. When we lived in Guatemala, we worked with some very destitute and poor people. In fact, there's this one village we would go to right along the railroad tracks where a bunch of people had moved in and started building houses out of cardboard boxes and wooden crates. If they were richer, they, could get, they would get wooden crates and build houses. And they were lived in shacks, shanties that they lived in. And you'd walk through and you'd see this destitute poverty. But what was wild when you'd walk through it, some, every once in a while we saw this one house where the lady out front was sweeping her dusty front porch. It was all dirt. It was a dirt porch, but she was sweeping it. And she had put some white paint on the cardboard and the, and the strips of wood she had for her shack. And we thought, what? This is weird. This house stands out in the middle of all of this poverty. And we had talked to her and she was like, oh yeah, I'm a Christian. Jesus is providing for me. He's meeting all my needs. Yes. I thought, how fascinating. So we talked about in that first uh, sermon message series, a uh, message in this series where talk, Paul talks about, I've learned to be content in whatever situation I find myself in myself in here's a woman in destitute poverty that even in the middle of that because her inside was changed you could see the results on the outside she did her best to take care of what was put in front of her because her heart had been changed and that's the solution when the inner transformation happens first you see the outer transformation Amen. and when you see chaos outside it points to chaos inside when you see chaos in somebody's life outside it points to chaos inside of them and that's a really important point because a lot of times you see people living chaotic, horrible lives and they're yelling and ranting at you about how the world should be a certain way. And really the issue has nothing to do with you. It has to do with them, the chaos around them. A person at war with themselves will never be at peace with those around them. That's good. So the bottom line always comes down to this. What's going on in your heart? Because the solution to the problems of the world, the solution to finding hope in this world is not going to be found in looking around you at the physical reality. The only solution is going to be found 
fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising his shame, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father. When you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, there is hope. If you're looking around you, if you're looking at your bank account to be your hope, you're going to be sorely disappointed. If you're looking at the value of the dollar, the price purchasing parity of the dollar, economics, you're going to be sorely disappointed. If you're looking for some relationship to be your hope, man, if I can just find somebody to love me. And so you'll latch on to anybody and the relationships just, you find yourself in one destructive relationship after another because you're looking for the relationship to provide something that only Jesus can provide. If you're looking to anything, if you're looking to politics, to some politician to save you, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Our only hope is in Jesus Christ. And when we stay anchored to that, it keeps us from getting pushed away by the waves and the winds and waking up every morning and feeling further, a little bit further and further from home from where we're supposed to be. That's where Paul talks about this. In Romans, he says this. He says, guys, I know it's rough out there, but I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. He says, what you're seeing right now, this isn't all there is. There's a glorious future ahead. And remember, your level of hope is based on how bright you believe the future is going to be. If you're looking to the physical world, your hope's going to be down. You're going to be depressed, discouraged, frustrated. But he says, if you keep your eyes fixed on the, the spiritual reality, he says, I, 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 you can't even imagine. These present sufferings, they're not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. What does that mean? You're the children of God. What it's saying is, creation the world knows that there's this moment that God is going to bring to the fullness all he's been doing in you. And creation is waiting for that moment as God makes us into who he wants us to be. It's waiting in expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. What does this mean? It's basically saying that the world is a mess. And oftentimes God will make the world, allow the world to continue in its chaos to reveal more and more that the world isn't our hope. There's a spiritual reality that's our hope. Amen. And you've got to keep your eyes fixed on that. So oftentimes he'll cause the systems and economies of the world to crumble in order that we will keep, well, instead of looking around at our bank accounts, at our, our ability to prom get promotions or our job or whatever, he'll start... To, to bring those to chaos so that we'll look to him in the middle of the struggles. So Paul goes on. He says, We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the, who, who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we eagerly await or wait eagerly for our adoption to the sonship, to the redemption of our bodies. There's going to come a moment when it, like it, in the twinkling of an eye, Jesus is going to come and he's going to set everything right. And right now we all know that there's something better out there. And that hope is the promise that we hold on to. And sometimes the only thing you can do is just groan. <laughs> you ever been in that place? You're like, ugh, not more. I can't handle more. I can't handle more of this with my daughter or my son. I can't handle any more of this with the price of food and life. I can't handle any more. And sometimes the groaning is all we can do. And he says, look... Creation is groaning, understanding that there's something better ahead so we don't lose hope. And sometimes all you just got to do is just groan <laughs> and call out to God, believing that something better is ahead. For in this hope, we were saved. But hope that is seen is not hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? Like, you don't, it, you know, it doesn't require hope if you already know it's in front of you. Hope requires an element of faith and believing that what's, what God says is true even when what he says is true doesn't look like it's true at the time. Believing that what he says is true is reality even when everybody else is saying, no, this is reality. And you say, I just, that's not what I feel in my gut is reality. What God says is reality is reality. And when you hang on to that, that's hope. But look, you, you don't need hope when everything's going great. You only need hope when you need a promise of a brighter future. And when you can hold on to that hope, it says that's our hope. But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. And here's what he says. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. 
God knew we were going to go through seasons and challenge, times of real hard challenges like the world is going through right now. And he sent the Holy Spirit to be our comforter and our peace and guide us. It says, we don't know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Sometimes the best prayer, prayer you can pray is, ugh, God. And that's enough. If you don't know what to pray, sometimes the best thing you can do is just say, God, I don't even know what to pray, but this weight is too much for me to bear. And you let him take it from you. And that's where it says this. This is where the good part comes. He says, and he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the spirit. You don't even have to voice your prayer. Sometimes you don't even know what you need, but the Lord knows what you need. So you just call out to him. Because the spirit intercedes for God's people. Intercedes just means praise. Praise for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And this is the good part. This is the famous verse we quote, but all this led up to it. He says, and we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You are here right now on this planet, in the middle of all this chaos, to anchor yourself to Jesus Christ as the sure foundation, the rock where you're not going to drift away and count on that. And then in that hope to be a light to the world around you. You see, I don't feel like much of a light right now. I'm just try, I'm fighting to overcome this addiction. I'm fighting to save my marriage. I'm fighting to pay my bills. I understand those struggles are real, but you've got to lift your vision and realize there's an even bigger purpose for you in all of this. And the struggles you're facing right now, you will get through on the other side of them. And the message that you'll have to share with others who are struggling with the same thing will help become their survival guide. So my encouragement to you guys is don't lose hope this morning. Anchor yourself. Stop looking at what's going on around you and counting on some political party to bail you out or some financial miracle to bail you out or the, the cost of gas to bail you out and start looking to Jesus because right in the middle of the hardest of times, if your hope is anchored in him, you're not going anywhere. You're gonna be able to stand firm. Your boat's not gonna drift off when you wake up and like, where am I? I'm lost at sea. That's not gonna happen if you're anchored to him. And there's no time like now. You don't need this when it's easy. You need this stuff when it's hard. And there's no time like now to show your faith. We talked about that last week. Get God's attention by saying, I'm going to hope in him even when it looks like there's nothing to hope in. So we're going to end this morning with something a little bit different. We're just going to take some time and pray. And maybe your prayer right now this morning is just, ugh. Maybe it's the groan. Maybe that's all you know how to pray this morning. Use this as a moment to take whatever's been weighing on your shoulders and say, God, I'm not walking out of here with this. I can't do this anymore. I need something solid to anchor myself to. And use this as some, a time to just give that to the Lord. Surrender it to him, whatever it needs to be. Maybe you need to surrender to him your financial future. You say, man, it's, not, it's looking bleak out there. Maybe you just need to surrender that. Maybe you need to surrender that relationship. You say, man, I've been fighting and trying to manipulate and trying to get them to do what I want, but I'm just gonna surrender and give it up. Maybe you've been having, some, man, just darkness. You just feel like darkness is covering you. And it just feels like you're in a dark place. Man, surrender that. Maybe you need to come and have somebody pray for you. But as we, as we do that, don't, as we do this time, don't skip out. Use this time to surrender whatever it is to the Lord and take your anchor and hook it to him. Because whoever hopes in the Lord will not be put to shame, it says in Isaiah. So let's close our eyes and pray. Father, we thank you so much that you are our anchor in the middle of the storm. Nothing can push us away when we're attached to you. I thank you, Lord, that, for, that you're gonna be an answer this morning for people who are struggling with addictions, people who are struggling with relational issues, financial issues, emotional issues. Maybe they're just feeling just darkness all around them, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, this is gonna be a moment of deliverance and freedom for them as we hook our anchor to you. You are the, the, what we can hold on to in the middle of this. Thank you. Thank you.
Psalm 37 says, Don't worry yourself because of evildoers, and don't be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and befriend faithfulness. Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord and trust in Him, and He will act. He will bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not yourself over the one who prospers in his way, over the man who carries out evil. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself, it tends only to evil. For the evildoers shall be cut off, but those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. In just a little while, the wicked will be no more. Though you look carefully at his place, he will not be there. But the meek will inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant peace. Better is the little that the righteous has than the abundance of many wicked. For the arms of the wicked shall be broken, but the Lord upholds the righteous. The Lord knows the days of the blameless and their heritage will remain forever. They will not be put to shame. In days of famine, they will have abundance. The steps of a man are established by the Lord when he delights in his way. Though he fall, he will not be cast down, for the Lord upholds him. I have been young and now I am old, but I have never ever seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is ever lending generously and his children become a blessing. Turn away from evil and do good, so you shall dwell forever. For the Lord loves justice. He will not forsake his saints. They are preserved forever but the children of the wicked will be cut off. The Lord will not abandon him to his power or let him be condemned when he is brought to trial. The salvation of the Lord, the salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their stronghold in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and he delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Father, we thank you that you are our refuge. You are a very present help in time of trouble. So I pray for everyone this morning. Here, Lord, whether it's the financial issues or the relational issues or the emotional issues, whatever it is, Lord, I thank you. This is going to be a moment of deliverance for them. I thank you, Lord, as they call out to you and anchor themselves in you. I thank you that no matter what's happening around them, they're going to see life and hope and joy. We're convinced that neither life nor death nor angels nor principalities nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth or any other created thing is able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what what sin could not do, strengthen strengthened uh, through the law God has set us free from the power of sin and death we thank you Lord we fix our eyes on what is unseen not on what is seen for we know that what is seen is temporary but what is unseen is eternal we thank you Lord for this let's all stand and we're going to close out and we're going to sing about the deliverance that God has for us and make this your moment of celebration and declaration we know that God is a deliverer Let's sing. Making a way out of deserts and rivers. You're making a way out of bondage and darkness. You're making a way. You're making a way. And if I know one thing, my God is a deliverer.
I pray you guys will be a light to the world. Man, when you start to feel hopeless, discouraged, depressed this week, man, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of your faith. He is the one who's going to be the answer for us. Be blessed. Be a light to the world. You guys are dismissed.